During my nearly one month sabbatical from YouTube, I got my grubby, not so little pause on Metroid Dread, the long awaited sequel to Metroid Fusion. And it was awesome. Not only was the 19 year wait for the sequel worth it, it managed to deliver one of the best 2D Metroidvania experiences I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing. And I've played a lot of them, including every 2D Metroid game and most of the 3D ones as well. No, not you, Other M. All of it wrapped up in a challenging package that kept me coming back at 3am for more. It also got me wondering about how Planet ZDR works, and if it would be plausible to come across an exoplanet like it somewhere out in the vast, untamed wilderness of the Milky Way. We're going to take a mostly spoiler-free dive into the makeup of Planet ZDR and try to answer that question. But first, be sure to do the thing and like, comment, join the mailing list, and subscribe. I'm Eric Malachite, author of Echoes of Olympus Mons, and this is Science Get. In Metroid Dread, Planet ZDR is made up of several subterranean levels that Samus must make her way up through to reach her ship on the surface. Someone or something has trapped her down there with all of the planet's subterranean wildlife as well as the deadly, reprogrammed Emmy robots, which gave me flashbacks to the end of Terminator. Obviously, this video is going to contain a lot of speculation. Yes, that. Thank you, computer. The first thing you'll probably notice is that the lowest point beneath ZDR's surface, an area known as Artaria, is a fairly temperate cave system. But what is odd is that there appears to be natural lighting in some of the background areas shining through holes in the cave system. Part of that may be due to the presence of Chozo technology, so we can safely ignore some of that. But what is surprising is the presence of freezing cold areas that can be found early on in the game. While it is never revealed how deep beneath the surface Artaria is, an event that transpires later on in the game reveals that if it were not for the heat being pumped into Artaria from the game's second area, Cataris, then it would rapidly freeze. That would suggest that ZDR does not have much in the way of subterranean heat. Here on Earth, and now, as we've just learned, Mars as well, the deeper that miners travel into the Earth, the hotter it gets. The world's deepest gold mine, known as the Npeneg Gold Mine in South Africa, which has a maximum depth of 2.5 kilometers, temperatures reach up to 66 degrees Celsius, 151 degrees Fahrenheit. A complicated cooling system is needed to bring those blistering temperatures back down to safe levels, but apparently ZDR is the opposite. As we all know, the Earth's core is very, very hot. Mars's core is a fair bit smaller than Earth's, but it too is liquid and presumably very, very hot as well. Does this then mean that ZDR's core is no longer molten? Well, we'll have to come back to this later, but the answer is maybe. The second area up from Artaria is Cataris and it is blisteringly hot. It's home to magma reserves, whatever that means, that are fed to other parts of the planet to keep them nice and toasty. Toasty. A lot of the rooms in this region are superheated thanks to all that lava. Now it's worthy to note that this is a little bit odd, but more on this later. Next up, we've got Dairon, which is accessible by shuttle from Cataris. Well, that's convenient. Cataris is home to a lot of robots, and is teeming with enough Chozo tech to make any space pirate cream themselves in excitement. But since it's mostly composed of sci-fi tech and robot factories, and doesn't appear to contribute to the makeup of the planet, we're gonna skip right along to the next area, Berenia. Berenia is described as a former marine research site and has some of the best music in the game. The Metroid fandom wiki describes it as being engulfed in water, and that's a pretty good description of the area. Now, this is interesting, because when I first arrived in Berenia, I thought I was on the surface. The shuttle that takes you to this area is suspended above an ocean, with a cloudy, covered sky. But in reality, you're still deep beneath the planet, so Berenia is home to a subterranean ocean. There are subterranean oceans on Earth, but we'll come back to this later. The area itself is some type of research station submerged beneath that ocean, which is really interesting. But what we're more concerned with is just how massive that ocean looks to be. Next up, we've got the Chozo Sanctuary of Ferenia. This area is mostly composed of buildings and relics left over from the Chozo. After that, we've got another area of interest known as Gavarin. 
It's basically an underground forest and is the area closest to the surface. In a lot of the backgrounds in this area, sunlight, or really some form of light, is visible through what look like to be massive tree trunks. This area is still very much underground though, but it is clear that this light source is probably the reason why there's so much plant life down here. From Gavarin, you can take shuttles to Ferenia, Hanubia, and Elan. Elan is another mechanical area. It's also home to a massive spoiler, so we won't be talking about it. Hanubia, however, is the only area that you can access that is on the surface. The final area is in the sky, so technically that's true. It is dark, rainy, and covered in rocky terrain. From the opening cutscene in Metroid Dread, we can tell that it's a world covered in clouds, and has an appearance similar to a gas giant rather than a terrestrial planet like Venus. From the previous section, there are a few things that we can determine about ZDR's makeup. Its surface is covered in thick cloud layers, and at the very least, Hanubia is covered in raging storms. Rainfall appears to be the norm. So how is it that there is a subterranean forest directly beneath this area? And what is the light source that we see down there? Now, it's probably a good reminder that this entire video is speculation. <coughs> Thank you again, computer. But I think it might be safe to suggest that the lighting isn't natural in any of the areas beneath the planet's surface. Or at least there's no clues to suggest what it might be. In the final boss fight, we finally get to see the sun. I won't show the boss room, but I will show this tiny section of the background that shows a break in the cloud layers, where we clearly see a shining yellow sun. Given how dark the surface of the planet seems to be, it might be safe to assume that sunlight never really reaches the surface. The Metroid Dread report suggests that ZDR has a surface composition very similar to planet SR388, but that planet featured clear skies and what looked to be a fairly temperate surface but composition has little to do with environmental conditions. Venus and Earth share similar composition, but have wildly different atmospheres, and Venus is devoid of liquid water. ZDR probably does not have a molten core, given how quickly Artaria can freeze over, and Adam, Samus's trusty AI exposition machine, suggests that if it weren't for the heat being pumped from Cataris, then the entire planet would rapidly freeze over. This is very odd. Volcanism, as far as planetary scientists know, is caused from a planet losing its internal heat, and it usually takes place at plate boundaries here on Earth. Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system, was formed through a different method, however. This volcano grew so large because of low Martian gravity and because of Mars's lack of plate tectonics. The best way to imagine Mars is like a steaming tea kettle. It's still geologically active, but the magma and heat is trapped deep beneath the surface, and the crust is acting like a hard shell, containing all of it. Cataris may be somewhat similar to this, though it would be hard to explain if ZDR does not have a molten core. Now, one thing that could cause subterranean heating on the level that we see in Cataris is something that's known as tidal heating. Moons like Europa and Titan receive quite a bit of tidal heating, and it's thought that the Earth-like worlds in the Trappist-1 system would have to deal with immense tidal heating due to their close proximity to their parent star. The planets in pretty much every Metroid game don't typically go too far in the realm of scientific world building. Did I just make up a new storytelling term, or did I? We're not really sure what type of star ZDR, Zebes, or SR388 orbit. Even the wiki doesn't hold the answer. But given how yellow ZDR star appears to be, we may be dealing with a main sequence sun-like star, which may mean that ZDR is in a similar orbit to Earth or Venus, that is to say, safely tucked away in the habitable zone, which would suggest that its main heat source is radiation not tidal heating like on Jupiter's moon Io. That radiation is blocked by thick cloud layers, however, hence why the planet's surface freezes so quickly. So Cataris's large amount of magma is an anomaly, especially because pockets like that presumably don't exist anywhere else on the planet. And since it's implied that it's ZDR's only real heat source, like some elaborate Chozo HVAC system, it would be difficult to explain its existence without an active molten core unless it was artificial. But if Cataris was made up of artificial magma reserves, in the Chozo 
were the ones that made them, why not just make backup regions of heated magma around other areas of the game world, just in case heat flow is cut off from Cataris? It's for this reason that I think that Cataris is more than likely built around a natural magma formation. Now, speaking of Artaria and molten cores, I recently made a video on some subterranean lakes on Mars that appear to be liquid. There has been some speculation about whether or not Mars's core would be large enough to provide heat to parts of the outer crust. It's possible that ZDR's core is still molten, but it's too small to heat Artaria and the other regions of the subterranean labyrinth that Samus is tasked with escaping. So Cataris could simply be a magma plume stretching up from that smaller core. We see magma plumes here on Earth, in fact. The Yellowstone supervolcano is fed by a massive magma plume. However, Earth has many of these, whereas it would be very strange if ZDR only had one magma plume and it's really hard to believe that the game world accessible to Samus is the entire planet, but that's video game logic for you. We won't really go into the life forms of ZDR, since those could have been brought to the planet with the Chozo, and since we don't know enough about the surface of the planet other than it's rainy, we don't know if plant life is ubiquitous to the planet or if the Chozo brought that stuff with them too. However, I think we have enough information here to determine whether or not ZDR could exist in real life, even if the planet is still a big ball of narrative. <laughs> I don't know. The Milky Way is home to some 4,000 plus exoplanets. Many of them are strange, hellish places that would probably vaporize you instantly, crush you under immense pressure, or pelt you to death with raining diamonds or rocks. But all those worlds have real physics, even those insane hot Jupiters. ZDR, however, is rather unremarkable as far as its features go. While we don't have a lot of information regarding its orbit, its parent star, its size, or even its rotational period, we do have quite a bit of information on its composition or at least the areas that make it up. If extrapolated into a real exoplanet, I believe that ZDR is at least somewhat plausible. While ZDR's interior caverns appear to have a lot of life forms roaming about in their own biomes, it would be pure conjecture to speculate on whether or not the planet would be able to support life without the intervention of the Chozo. But it is implied that the planet has an ocean thanks to the abundance of storm clouds and the subterranean ocean that makes up Berenia. As I mentioned before, Earth also has subterranean oceans and water sources that give this a bit of credence. Also, Jupiter's moon Europa also has a subterranean ocean that basically makes up most of the planet's volume. While the presence of a single magma plume that feeds the rest of the planet with heat is definitely odd, if the planet's core was small enough, this might be plausible. But something to note is that even on Mars, which does not have plate tectonics, there is not just one volcano. There are many, even though they're on a much larger scale than here on Earth. So if ZDR only had one magma plume, I think that this would be regarded as an anomaly by scientists. But perhaps something that isn't entirely impossible. It would really depend on how ZDR's crust is composed. If it was more like a thick shell like that of Mars, this might be a good explanation. Based off of everything that I've ever read about exoplanets and the planets in our own solar system, the idea that a planet like ZDR could exist somewhere in the vast reaches of the Milky Way is a solid maybe. There is a lot we don't know about this fictional planet, but what is there doesn't seem to be impossible, at least if we extrapolate things to a full planet and ignore how easy it is to blow up planets in the Metroid universe. Looking at you, Zebus and SR388. And again, that's speculation in its purest form. There are a lot of video gamey specific tropes that make up the planet, and its design is primarily concerned with creating a satisfying map to explore, not on real planetary science. But that gameplay, though, is fantastic. <sighs> Time to play! Swear to me! But what do you think? Do you think ZDR could exist in our universe? What about other planets in the Metroid universe? Let me know in the comments below. If you dug this content, be sure to drop me a like and subscribe. And hey, if you dig exoplanet videos, check this one out. And look at all those wonderful names. Thank you, patrons. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next mission. Toasty.